Today uh, we're going to be talking about Oedipus Tyrannos. But before we begin, I want to introduce uh, the ancient Greek tragedy. So uh, Oedipus Tyrannos was first performed around 429 BCE, uh, which is already um, in the middle of the golden classic era of ancient Greek dra drama and tragedy. Legend has it that Greek tragedy was first performed in the 5th century BCE. Uh, sorry, 6th sixth, sixth century or, or uh, early 5th century. Um, and at the beginning, it was just one actor and a group of people called the chorus, a uh, 合唱. Uh, and um, from the beginning, Greek tragedy and Greek drama were performed as part of a festival called the Great Dionysia to celebrate the god of wine, Dionysus. This festival is held in Athens uh, every spring. And during this festival, uh, the Greeks would hold a competition, a drama competition. They would invite or I guess uh, allow pre-select three playwrights and they would compete for first, second and third place. Each playwright had one day to perform or to to put on a production of three tragedies and one satyr play. A satyr is a mythical half boy, half goat. Uh, and in myth, a satyr loves to make jokes, play pranks. So a satyr play is a short comedy a uh, low comedy full of like jokes about the body, sex. So these ancient Greek tragedians who wrote classic works of Western literature would also write these low comedies. And it was generally agreed by the Athenian public that Ending the day with this kind of comedy is the best kind of ending after watching three tragedies in a row. So the first competition was won by a guy named Thespis. Uh, and his name is the source of the English word thespian, which today means a serious actor. And the award for his winning is or was a goat, Sanyang. So uh, that is the source of the word tragedy, which in ancient Greek means a goat song. Uh, so later on, uh, the chorus stabilized into 12 people. So it was one actor uh, talking and 12 people singing back to him. The actors were always men. Uh, and uh, the actors also would wear masks and cloaks, so not costumes, and they were not realistic. Everyone knew that they were actors and putting on a performance. Uh, there was no attempt to be realistic. Uh, in the 4th century BCE, the first great Greek playwright, Aeschylus, invented or changed the Greek theater uh, by adding a second actor. And so that is what is usually considered the birth of modern ideas of theater, right? Two people acting out a situation on stage and with a chorus sometimes responding. Um, after Aeschylus, the next major innovation was by Sophocles, who wrote the play that we're going to be reading today. Sophocles um, added a third actor. 
and he also expanded the chorus to 15 people. And so starting from Sophocles, you could have more and more complex situations. We can have uh, situations where two people are talking about something and the audience can see the third person reacting. Sophocles is usually considered the best of all the ancient Greek tragedians. When Aristotle, Yadisidoda, wrote his poetics, Sishri, and he discussed the art of tragedy, Aristotle used only one major example, and that example was the play that we're going to be reading in our class, Oedipus Tyrannos by Sophocles. Therefore, this play is widely considered the classic standard for ancient Greek tragedy. So what did it look like to watch an ancient Greek play? Let me show you. Uh, so this is the theater of Dionysus in Athens. This is what it looks like today. Uh, it was lost for hundreds of years and only recently, or not recently, only rediscovered in the 19th century. Um, so this kind of theater is called an amphitheater. And you might recognize this style because in Taiwan, every big city park has an amphitheater. And the design makes it so that the sound will travel naturally through, uh, across the entire theater, even to the back row of the audience. So, uh, of course, the Greeks did not have microphones. But with this kind of design, the actors and the chorus could speak and sing uh, at a slightly louder than usual volume, and everyone would be able to hear them. Speaking of uh, singing, Greek drama was born from poetry. And that's why when we read uh, the Oedipus Tyrannos, it's written in poetry. So from the very beginning, literature, uh, drama and poetry are connected together. This is what uh, historians believe the theater of Dionysus looked at its biggest. It was uh, expanded over the years uh, before it was lost. Um, and I wanted to show you three main things. One is this circle in the middle is called the orchestra. And this is usually where the chorus would perform. Then behind the orchestra, you have this building. This building is called the skinny. And it's the origin of the English word scene. Uh, scene, the skinny. Uh, represents the main setting of the play. It was usually painted and decorated to uh, give an idea of where we are in the story. And there is a door in the middle of the skinny, is this black part here in the center, uh, where actors, uh, if they exit from a building in the story, they would walk out from this center door. But on the two sides of the skinny, uh, and actors would perform in front of the skinny, so between the orchestra and the skinny. On the two sides of the stage are two other exits, and usually the exit uh, stage left would be going toward a city, and the exit stage right would be going toward the countryside. So in the story, if the play says someone arrives from the city, they would enter from the left. If it says that someone leaves to go somewhere else to another city, which means they would have to travel through the countryside, they would leave through the uh, exit on the right. Um, so this here, let's see. 
this is what a skinny would look like according to a historian. Uh, so you see the door in the middle. And this front area is where the three actors would perform. And then you see on the left and the right, there are two directions going in and out. Now, uh, later, as Greek theater grew more complex, uh, some plays needed a second story on top of the skinny. Um, but that came later. And then as the theater developed through the Hellenistic Shirahua Sedai and the Roman eras, the skinny grew larger and larger and, and there was like a second level for the actors to walk on. It became more and more complex and ultimately developed into the theaters that we see today. Uh, here you get a, a better sense of how big an ancient Greek theater could be, how many people could watch the play at the same time. So this is the environment where the play took place. When we think about plays, if you remember from last semester, we talked a lot about what's on the stage, what, how do the actors dress, what objects do they use, but in ancient Greek theater, there was basically none of this. It was scenery painted in a certain way, actors wearing masks and actors cloaks, and that's it. Everything else was speaking, singing, and body language. The chorus would also sometimes dance. So uh, the Great Dionysus, uh, Great Dionysia Festival, also known as the City Dionysia, is uh, for the performance part, for the drama part, three playwrights each put on three tragedies and one satyr play. So for three consecutive days, Athenians and the judges would spend the entire day watching performances of ancient Greek theater. So for people who loved the theater, it was a great three days. Now uh, I want to talk now a bit about the play that we're going to read today. But before that, do you have questions about the background of ancient Greek theater? OK, let's talk about the Oedipus Tyrannos. The story of Oedipus was part of ancient myth, so uh, ancient audiences already knew the basic idea of the story. Um, but of course, myths, as we discovered last week, are not very detailed and can be changed over time. Different people can add different ideas and different details. So when Sophocles first put on this play in around 427, 429 BCE, um, people knew the general idea, but they were still uh, anticipating how this master playwright would interpret and uh, perform this play. Back in those days, the playwright not only wrote the play, he also acted in the play and directed the other actors in the chorus. So he was really, that's why the word playwright is spelled like that, right? It's not spelled T-I-E, or sorry, yeah, it's not spelled W-R-I-T-E. It's not the person who writes the play. The second half of this word, write, comes from the word meaning work or to make. So a playwright from the ancient Greek tradition is not just someone who writes the play, it's someone who makes the play. Writing, lead actor, director, helps design the skinny, the whole thing. Sophocles all, by that time was already known as a master playwright. Um, throughout his career, every year he competed at or every year that he did compete at the Great Dionysia, he never came in third place. He was either first place or second place. Uh, and this play, Oedipus Tyrannos, uh, even though it is now considered the 
classic idea of a Greek tragedy. In that year, it only won second place. For some strange reason. Now, uh, the story of Oedipus very simply is Oedipus is a king who a prophecy says would end up killing his father and marrying his mother. Because of this, he when he was a young man, he ran away from home and later uh, became king of another city called Thebes. Um, and one day a plague, when E strikes Thebes, and he has to, in order to uh, end the plague, he has to solve the murder of the previous king, Laius. And it turns out that Laius was the person that Oedipus himself killed. And when Oedipus became king and married the queen and had children with her, uh, unknowingly, he was born in Thebes. Uh, but for because of the same prophecy that said he would kill his father and marry his mother, his father, Laius, sent him to die in the in the wilderness, but he was saved and sent to another city and grew up into Oedipus. So in fact, he was the person unknowingly who killed his father and married his mother. Um, and that's the basic idea of the story, which is um, he did all of this unknowingly because of a prophecy. Uh, this play is also famous because it was the source of Freud's idea of the Oedipus complex, Lian Mu Qingjie. Uh, Freud, uh, he, uh, from this play, he developed the idea that uh, every boy, I was about to say every child, but no, Freud only talks about men. Every boy during his childhood at one point develops the desire to kill and replace his father uh, in the relationship with his mother, to take the place of the father in terms of the relationship with the mother. This is called the Oedipus complex. Uh, so I guess in Chinese, a better name would be Si Fu Lian Mu Qingjie. Um, later theorists of psychoanalysis, Qing Sun Fenji, believed that something similar happened with women and girls. And so they developed uh, a similar idea for their girls called the Electra complex. The Electra was a woman in another Greek play who killed her mother to sleep with her father. So it's a similar idea. Now, is it true? Does every child have an Oedipus complex or an Electra complex? Probably not. You see, uh, the reason that Freud came up with this theory is because when he first started out as an analyst, uh, Fen Shisi, like a psychiatrist, early kind of psychiatrist. Uh, a lot of his patients were young girls and young men, and uh, they kept telling him that uh, their parents, especially their fathers, had sexually abused them when they were younger or perhaps were still abusing them. But because most of these children came from well-known families, their fathers were famous and powerful, uh, when Freud tried to discuss these results, nobody believed him. People thought, how could it be possible that so many famous and well-known men were abusing their children? And so uh, to save his own career, Freud had to come up with a different explanation. And his explanation was that these children and young people were fantasizing that these were fantasies and not things that actually happened. And why would they have these fantasies? Well, uh, they must want to, uh, or they must have had some kind of early sexual attachment to the first woman in their lives or the first man in their lives, which of course would be their mother and father. Um, so from the beginning, it, this logic was 
quite false. But because psychoanalysis became so influential, especially in the 20th century, well, not especially, Freud wrote the interpretation of dreams in the late 19th century. The first English edition appeared in 1900. So a psychoanalysis was a 20th century thing. Because it was so influential, many people um, picked up on these ideas without knowing their source. Uh, and as a kind of strong theory, if once you believe in it and you look at human society, there's all different kinds of phenomena or events that seem to be able to be explained using psychoanalysis. Uh, today, modern psychoanalysis is not as uh, does not follow as strict uh, theory, so it doesn't always agree with Freud. Uh, but it is still based on the sexual notions and fantasies of the unconscious. And the funny thing is that modern psychoanalysis with which is based more on evidence and less on like so called fantasies has been proven to be more effective in the long term than alternative kinds of uh, treatments for mental health. Um, so. From Freud's crazy theories, he apparently discovered something that is actually true about the human mind. But it's the true part is not the Oedipus complex. That part is is just crazy. But because of this, this play, Oedipus Tyrannos, is one of the is probably the is the most famous play from ancient Greece. Uh, now let's look at the title. It's called Oedipus because the guy's name is Oedipus. It's called Tyrannos, or in Latin Tyrannus, U.S. Tyrannos is Greek. Uh, because this is the kind of ruler that Oedipus was. The word uh, tyrannus or tyrannos is closely related to the English word tyrant. Uh, tyrant in Chinese is baojing. But back in those days, that's not the meaning of the word tyrannous. Tyrannos simply meant a single person with complete power that is not the son of the previous king. And that's who Oedipus is, or at least that's who people, that's the kind of person that he thought he was. He didn't know that he was the son of the previous king. He gained power in Thebes because the citizens trusted him. Uh, and therefore, because he uh, did not inherit his power, uh, he is not a king. He is a so-called tyrant. The play is written in verse in poetry, and so uh, for the translation, I chose a simpler translation by Emily Wilson, who also translated the Odyssey version that we read. She follows the same strategy here as she did there. For the actor's lines, she has translated them into iambic pentameter. So each line goes da 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 five beats. But for the chorus, uh, she chose a different strategy. In the original language, the rhythm of the chorus is different from the rhythm of the actors. It's more lyrical, it's more musical. So uh, Wilson decided to translate the chorus using a more variable meter, so it's not as strict uh, rhythm. The rhythm changes a bit more. It's longer, it's shorter at different periods. To give the reader the sense that this is more musical and less dialogue. Another thing that you should know about this translation is that the line numbers refer to the original Greek. So if you have looked through the PDF, you will notice that the gap between line numbers, even though every gap is 10 numbers in English, the the intervening lines may not be just 10 lines, maybe more, maybe less. 
So when you uh, take your final exam and you want to answer the question about this play, please give the page number as well, or uh, I would prefer you give just the page number, uh, not the line number, because the line number in English is not dependable. Unless, of course, the line falls exactly on like uh, 10 or line 20 or line 30. And this is why if you look at the PowerPoint, uh, today's reading is from line one to circa line 510. C means circa, which means around. This is Latin. Um, what I'm asking you to read to is page up to page 20. Uh, if you look at line 10, a little below line 10 here. Actually, let me let me show you on screen. I actually have the paper book in front of me, so I'm, I'm using that. But if you look here it, uh, after here, enter Creon from the city and uh, today's reading is up to here. Um, in the next two weeks, um, the place where I want you to well, I guess for next week, the place I want you to stop just so happens to be a multiple of 10, so the line is certain. And then, of course, for the third week, you should finish the play. OK, so that's the introduction to this play. Do you have questions? OK, let's take a look. Um, you're supposed to have read this, so let's take a look at this week's questions. One, Oedipus says that it's OK to hear Apollo's words. Apollo, of course, is the god of prophecy. It's OK to hear his words in front of the people of Thebes because, quote, I feel more pain for them than for myself and my own life. So the question is, what do you think might be the pain in his own life? Two, uh, what do you think is the purpose of the choral song? So uh, throughout the play, the chorus will sing a number of times. These are called choral songs. So what do you think is the purpose of the, uh, the one on pages 8 to 10? And how can you tell? Why do you think this is the purpose? Question three, do you think it makes sense for Oedipus to curse himself too? Why or why not? Question four, do you think Tiresias, the prophet, Yu uh, Xianzi, the prophet, is right to refuse to tell the truth to Oedipus at first? If so, why? If not, why not? And do you think he is right to change his mind out of anger? If so, why? If no, why not? Uh, so Tiresias, we've already met. He appeared in the Odyssey. He's the guy that Odysseus went to the underworld to consult. And then question five. What do you think is the purpose of this second choral song and how can you tell? OK, let's take a look at the play. Uh, the cast, people who speak, we have a priest, we have Oedipus, we have Creon. Creon is uh, Oedipus's brother-in-law. Uh, we have Heresius, the prophet. Jocasta, it is his wife and and his mother, um, and the sister to Creon. We actually already met Jocasta in the Odyssey. Also, when Odysseus went to Hades to speak with the dead, there was a group of famous women. One of them was named Epicasta or Epicasti. 
and she was the wife of Oedipus who killed herself when she realized the truth. Uh, that was that the name Epicosti comes from a slightly different tradition of this myth. The version that Sophocles uses gives her the name Jocasta. Then we have a herdsman, Muyangren, first messenger, second messenger, and a chorus of 15 male Theban elders. So in this story, the chorus is made up of senior people, older people. That's not always true. Depending on the play, the chorus can represent different groups of people. Here they are elders. We also have people who don't speak but appear on stage. You have children and acolytes. Acolytes are like student priests. And they appear on stage accompanying the priest. You have a slave of Tiresias. Um, Ancient Greece was a slave holding culture. Uh, slaves existed in ancient Greece. They, but it's different from the slavery that we usually think about when we talk about slavery from the American South. In ancient Greece and uh, most of the ancient world, slaves were usually, uh, they, they came from two sources. One, uh, they were captured in war. And, and um, in ancient Greece, if you are captured in war, your family might offer a ransom, sujing, um, but your captor may refuse the ransom if it's too low, or your family might be too poor to offer a ransom, in which case you became a slave. The second source of slaves was people who owed too much money and the courts uh, declared them enslaved to their debtor. In both cases, um, slaves could be freed by their master or they could work and buy their own freedom. Uh, for war slaves, you could pay your ransom. For Debt slaves, you can pay your debt. And once you pay off uh, your, once you buy your freedom, you become a freeman, someone who is free, but not a citizen. Uh, in Athens, this was especially important. Today, we talk about citizenship, and we say, like, um, if you're a citizen and you get in trouble in a foreign country, uh, your government will help you, things like that. But in ancient Athens, citizenship had much more power. In ancient Athens, not only was the executive government chosen by election, but also the judicial government, the law courts. Uh, Athens had juries, Pesantuan, of 500 citizens, each case. And the juries voted to decide each case. So in other words, if you were not a citizen, you and like something happened uh, to you or your someone you care about and they end up in court, you had absolutely no participation possibility in deciding what happens to them. Um, there were also various other things that citizens could do and things that citizens had to do. Um, and in ancient Athens, citizens were limited to men who were, uh, sorry, who limited to people who were born from two citizens in Athens. Today, some uh, for citizenship, some countries say you have to be born in our country. Some countries say you have to be born to one citizen. In Athens, it was both. You had to have two citizen parents and be born in Athens. Um, everyone else was like uh, either slaves or non-citizen residents. Uh, and so, in the slavery of ancient Athens, unlike the slavery of the American South, 
if slaves had children, the children were not slaves. They were just uh, non citizen residents. Whereas in the American South, if you are a slave and you give birth to a child, the child is also a slave. Um, so the systems were a bit different. And also slaves were treated better in ancient Greece, not by law, but because of the economy. In the American South, they needed slaves to pick cotton and do lots of hard work that nobody would be willing to do unless they were paid a lot of money. And so slave owners had to use violence in order to force their slaves to keep working. Whereas in ancient Greece, slaves did do the work that nobody else wanted to do. Uh, and also they did domestic work, housekeeping, cooking, cleaning, childcare. Um, but these were all jobs that everyone agreed somebody had to do. And they were not uh, so terrible that you might die from doing them. If you if you a slave uh, picked cotton from day to night with no rest, they might die. In the American South, it was very hot. The sun was uh, very hot and bright, uh, and that's one reason why most people didn't want to do those jobs. Uh, but in ancient Greece, it was just things like taking care of the garbage, uh, building roads, these kind of things. Not that terrible. Um, so slavery, of course, today in any kind of form we think is a terrible thing. Everyone should be free to choose their own life. Um, but I just want to let you know that ancient Greek slavery is not the same as uh, slavery in the American South. So Tiresias has a slave because Tiresias is blind. He needs someone to guide him. Oedipus, as the king, would have slaves, and he also has attendants, people who do what he orders. Then we have the daughters of Oedipus. They appear late in the play, but they don't speak. His daughters are famous because they have their own play. Throughout his life, Sophocles wrote three plays about the Oedipus myth. Uh, the earliest play that he wrote is called the Antigone. Antigone is the name of Oedipus's older daughter. He also had a younger daughter called Ismene. Uh, and so the Antigone is the story of his daughters and his, his sons also. He also had two sons, um, Eteocles, and Polynices. You don't have to remember this. Uh, we're not reading their story. But the Antigone is a very good play if you're interested. Um, the second play he wrote about this myth was this one, Oedipus Tyrannos. The third play he wrote about this myth is called Oedipus at Colonus. And it deals with the death of Oedipus and how he comes to terms with what has happened in his life. How he sort of uh, not overcome his trauma, but how he comes to accept his trauma. Uh, so Sophocles wrote the Antigone first, but the Antigone actually happens the latest in the story, in the myth. In the order of the myth, it's first this one, Oedipus, at, uh, Oedipus Tyrannos, then Oedipus at Colonus, and then the latest in the story is the Antigone. Oedipus at Colonus is also interesting because it was performed after Sophocles died. He wrote the play, but he died before he could produce it. And that year at the Great Dionysia, Oedipus at Colonus won first place. And so Sophocles won the competition even after he was dead. Uh, and then, of course, we have bystanders. Well, I guess uh, this is optional. Some some people would say that you don't have bystanders, Luren. Bystanders are simply the chorus. If you need bystanders, the chorus becomes the bystanders. Um, but I guess it would add to the effect of the story if you had people reacting to the story in the play. 
Another thing about ancient Greek tragedy is that there were no stage directions. So all of these italics, 斜体字, were added by the translator. So anytime in this play you see that it says someone walks in, someone walks out, someone does something, these are all the best guesses of the editor, of the translator. We don't really know for sure what happened on the stage. Okay, uh, what was the question again? Ah, uh, pain in my own life. On page six. Uh, let's see. Here. So uh, in this part of the play, the people are asking King Oedipus uh, what he could do to help end the plague. And he says the only solution is to send someone to ask the oracle at Delphi. Uh, it was traditional to think that the oracle spoke directly for Apollo, the god of prophecy. This is actually also quite interesting. The oracle at Delphi is not like the other prophets. Uh, the oracle at Delphi, usually a woman, uh, sat on a three-legged stool, Sanjiao Yi, on top of a crack in the earth. And from this crack were gas from beneath the earth. And when the oracle breathed in the, this gas, she would enter into a kind of drugged state, Mi Hun de Zhuang Tai. And she would say like crazy things. And people would take these things to be the word of Apollo. Uh, now, of course, in real life, what the oracle said mostly was probably nonsense. Uh, but in literature, the oracle always says something that makes sense. So Oedipus has sent Creon to Delphi to ask the oracle what to happen, uh, what to do, and Creon returns. Uh, and Creon, when Oedipus asks, uh, what did the oracle tell you? Creon says, if you want all these bystanders to hear, I can speak now, or we can go inside. So apparently it's something that Creon is worried should not be shared with the public. Uh, Oedipus, however, is uh, very open, honest, and courageous person. And so he replies, speak out to everyone. I feel more pain for them than for myself in my own life. So of course the citizens are in pain because of the plague, right? People are dying. Uh, but what kind of pain would Oedipus have for myself and my own life? Well, first of all, he's the king, so if his people are dying, he also presumably a good late, a good leader would feel the pain of his citizens. Uh, but secondly, this goes back to why Creon hesitates to explain what the oracle said in front of everyone. The, apparently the idea here is he implies that this is something that may hurt Oedipus or that may inspire some distrust in Oedipus from the people. So in order to explain why he doesn't care about this, Oedipus says uh, he cares more about the people than about himself. So any kind of pain that Creon might cause him by telling everybody what the oracle said, Oedipus says is not as strong a pain as the pain of his citizens who are dying. That he feels for his dying citizens. Uh, and this pain. 
is would also have been felt by the audience. Because in 429 or 427 BCE, Athens had just recovered from its own plague in around 430 BCE. So here in the play, when it's talking about a plague, the audience would be extremely familiar with that kind of pain. Um, OK, so that's the first question. Do you have questions? OK, the next question, the choral song on page 8 to page 10. Chorus, there we go. Uh, so in the scene before this, uh, Oedipus has just promised that um, he will get to the bottom of who killed Laius, I believe. Yes, uh, he will get to the bottom of who killed Laius and thereby end the plague. Uh, so this is what the chorus sings. What are you, sweet word of Zeus, that traveled from golden Delphi to glorious Thebes? I am quaking with fear. My heart is stretched tight with the terror. So this first part is reacting to the previous scene, right? The words from Delphi, the oracle. Healer of Delos, Apollo, our healer. Delos is the city of a uh, that is closely associated with Apollo. Uh, Apollo is the god of prophecy. He is also the god of healing. So what they pray to Apollo to end the plague. Apollo also speaks to them through the oracle at Delphi. You fill me with awe, Jing. Uh, Yes. What debt must I pay you? A new one or something returned from the circling seasons of time. So is it a new debt or an old debt? Tell me, immortal oracle, child of golden hope. So here the chorus is concerned about how they should fulfill the oracle's uh, prophecy that they have to solve the murder in order to end the plague. Daughter of Zeus, I call on you first, deathless Athena. And your sister, the earth shaker Artemis. OK, this is strange. Artemis is the goddess of the moon, the hunt and virginity. Zongzhen. Uh, Zhenjie, I guess I should say. But she's usually not called the Earth Shaker. The Earth Shaker is usually Poseidon, god of the sea. But apparently here it's a sign of how important Artemis is. Maybe she could help end the plague and therefore she would be important enough to shake the Earth. Uh, and so they pray to Athena, they pray to Artemis and they pray to Apollo. Artemis and Apollo are brother and sister. They both use a bow and arrow, gongjian. So they call Apollo far shooter. Uh, come and appear to me, triple protectors. Uh, horror, my sufferings cannot be counted. All of the people are sick. Our famous city is increased by nothing, which means more people are dying than are being born. The women emerge from their labors, labors, and shrieks with no children. So this means that uh, even when women do get pregnant and they do give birth, the children, the babies are born dead. So they have no children. Uh, the word labor usually means work. 
but the English phrase to go into labor means to begin giving birth. Uh, a, a woman's body begins to give birth. So labor here also means giving birth. Uh, so here they're mostly talking about the effect of the plague so far. Let's take a short break and we'll come back in 10 minutes. So we have seen the chorus react to the previous scene. Now they are praying to three different gods at the same time. Uh, be, and now they're describing the horror of the plague. Women give birth to dead babies, like birds on the wing, one here and one there. You see people sent faster than furious fire to the shore of the Western God. Uh, this presumably means Hades, even though uh, it's not usually associated with the West. Maybe Sophocles is drawing on a different tradition. The comparison with fire is very interesting. We know from the Iliad that the Greeks burned their dead. Uh, so it's a double imagery of death, right? Sent to the Western God is death faster than fire. So the fire itself is also a sign of death. The city is dying. The dying are numberless. There is no pity for children who lie underfoot and bring death. The idea here is that children who die. Uh, lie on the floor under one's feet, so like you might walk on them. But these bodies bring death because it's a plague. If you deal with dead sick bodies, you yourself might catch the disease, so nobody can bury them. They're lying around everywhere on the floor. Uh, women scream their desperate prayers of pain. Uh, and there are also the uh, wailing of mourners. Uh, for their sake, golden daughter of Zeus, this is Athena. Look with kind eyes and protect them. Now a new god, Ares, god of war. A fire is burning me now in the din and the clamor without shields or weapons of bronze. So it's now the chorus is now comparing the plague to to war. It's a war without shields or weapons. Uh, and they're praying to various gods to help them win this war. Uh, and then they play to another version of Apollo, Apollo Lycaeus, uh, who apparently, according to the uh, footnote, uh, may be associated with Apollo's role as cause and healer of disease. So it's addressing Apollo not as the God of prophecy, but as the God of healing. Uh, praying to Apollo, to Artemis. And also to Bacchus, which is another name for Dionysus, the God of wine. So that's the first choral song. What is its purpose? How can you tell? Well, we just said it's reacting to the previous scene and it's invoking the gods. It's describing the the environment, the situation of the plague, and it's invoking the gods to help protect them and to defeat the plague. So I think the purpose of this choral song 
is to give us a better sense of the world of the story, what's going on in the world. Because if we only focus on the actors, it's just two or three people talking on in a specific place. This the place of the play never changes. We are always in front of the king's home. Uh, so if we can't change place and we only have three people at the same time, then one way to give us a bigger sense of that world and that society is to use the chorus. And the chorus therefore can sing about what is it like to be in a city struck by plague? Um, what are the people doing? What does it sound like? What does it feel like? And whom do the people pray to? Which gods do they pray to? So it gives us more background information, gives us a feeling of this society, and it also gives us a sense of the people's desperate hope that they're praying to three, four, five different gods to help save them. OK, do you have questions about number two? OK, let's move on to question three. Do you think it makes sense for Oedipus to curse himself? Page 11. Uh, so here. Uh, he um, issues a curse on the killer of Laius, the previous king. And anyone who helps that killer. Uh, because this is what the Oracle says they must do to end the plague. Uh, it says here, whoever that man is, I ban him from this land where I hold sway, which means where I hold control, where I hold power. No one must let him in or speak to him or share with him in sacrifice or prayer to gods nor let him touch the holy water. You must all push him from your homes. This man pollutes us, woman. As the Pythian Oracle, the Oracle at Delphi, the God, Apollo, has recently revealed to me. I fight beside the dead man and the God, so I am on the side of Laius, I am on the side of Apollo. Whether the secret criminal did this alone or with accomplices, Tonghuo, I pray that he wears out a poor, unlucky life in misery. So not to live a life, but to wear out, Xiao Mo Jing Hao Jing, a poor, unlucky life in misery, Beitan. And this is the question part. If that man has been inside my house and present at my hearth, hearth is bilu. Uh, in an age before electricity, the place of fire in the house, lu zao, uh, was the most important part of the house. So present at my hearth. As you can see, this word is related to the heart, the human heart. That's how important it is for a house. So if that man has been inside my house, been present at my heart, and I may, and if I know about it, I hear vow, which means swear or promise, to take these curses I have made on me. So he curses everyone who helps the criminal, and he says, even me, if I unknowingly have helped this criminal, I too will curse myself. Do you think that makes sense? Well, on the one hand, yes, right? Because this also includes unknowing. So it's possible. Well, I mean, let me let me uh, start over. Yes, because Oedipus has to set a good example for his people. Uh, he has to 
continue to have their trust. And one way of doing this is by promising that not even the king is above blame. If the king does something wrong, he too must be punished. But Oedipus is probably not expecting that he did do something wrong. So on the other hand, it could be dangerous for him to curse himself. Because what if he did accidentally help the killer? It's been many years since Lys died. It's been enough years for Oedipus to marry Queen Jocasta and have two daughters. So it's not like yesterday. Throughout all this time, it may be possible that Oedipus accidentally helped the killer. And therefore he would be bringing that curse down upon himself for real. Uh, but we can also say that this sense of danger to himself is exactly what gains people's trust in him. They know that it's not an empty promise. It is possible that he would have to curse himself. Uh, and because he makes a vow, right? Uh, I hear vow. So he's not just saying it, he has to follow through. A vow is made to the gods. So if he says he'll do this and he doesn't do it, the gods will punish him. So it does look like it makes more sense to risk cursing himself in order to keep the people believing in him and still trusting in him in a time of plague and panic and uh, social collapse. Now, what Oedipus does not know at this mo moment is that he himself is the killer of Laius. Uh, so he actually is cursing himself. He doesn't know this, but we the audience who already know the story of Oedipus knows this. This is called dramatic irony. Remember, the word irony simply means that something is not what it looks like. There is a difference between the situ what the situation looks like and what the situation actually is. Dramatic irony, Xi Ju Xing de Fan Feng, says that this difference is something that the audience knows, but that the characters do not. So the characters think that it is one kind of situation, but the audience knows that it is in fact a different kind of situation. At the same time, this is also an example of cosmic irony. Cosmic irony says that the characters think that it's one kind of situation, but the gods know that it's a different kind of situation or that fate knows that it's a different kind of situation. Here, of course, the gods, of course, know that Oedipus is the person that he's looking for and fate also knows this. So this is also an example of cosmic irony. OK, do you have questions about this one? OK, let's look at question four. First, he refuses to tell the truth. Then he tells the truth because he gets angry. So uh, Oedipus has vowed that he will track down the killer of Laius. So for help, he asks the prophet Tiresias because Tiresias is apparently privy to the knowledge of the gods even though he is blind. So Oedipus summons him. Tiresias arrives, but when he asks Tiresias, uh, what do you know? Uh, let's see, on page 13. Uh, here, Tiresias, enter Tiresias, blind, escorted by enslaved helpers. And then Oedipus asks him to help. 
if you have information from the birds or any other art of prophecy, do not withhold it. So don't keep it for yourself. Uh, so the birds are one art of prophecy. Here, art does not mean ishu. Art here means craft, skill, jishu, jinan. Uh, so one popular form of prophecy in ancient Greece was to look at the birds, different kinds of birds, uh, different numbers of birds and the direction that they fly in, or if there's more than one bird, the the organization of their flock, like the the shape that they make in the sky. All of these were sources of information about what the gods are thinking. Uh, this kind of prophecy is called augury, the art of uh, looking at the birds for prophecy. Uh, and Tiresias is especially good at this because remember he's blind, so he depends on his slaves to describe to him what kind of birds, where are they going, how many are there. But even from this indirect limited information, he can still tell you what the gods are thinking. So Oedipus asks him to help, but his response is, it's terrible. How terrible to think when thinking does no good. So if thinking does not lead to a good result, it is terrible to try to think. I knew all that, but I forgot, or I would not have come. Huh? Well, as you might expect, he talks in a very cryptic and meter, iton meter, a cryptic manner, a cryptic way, as befits a prophet. Right? If you talk to a holy man, you don't expect him to say things in a straightforward way. But what he says is, I forgot that thinking is bad if the result is not good. But if I remembered, I would not have come, even though the king has called me. Uh, send me back home. Uh, then he says, I will never reveal my ruin. This is very interesting. Tiresias is supposedly talking about how to find the killer of Laius, but here he says that basically that if he tells what he knows, it is his own ruin. Uh, and the idea that an ordinary person would have is that his answer would be displeasing to the king and the king might punish him. Of course, we know that it would be Tiresias's ruin because the truth is that the killer is the king himself. Uh, and so if you ruin the king, you ruin the kingdom, and if you ruin the kingdom, you ruin everybody in the kingdom including Tiresias himself. Uh, he says, I will never reveal my ruin. I will not say yours. The footnote uh, points out these quotation marks. I think these were added by the translator. So if you remove these quotation marks, this sentence could say, I will never reveal my ruin. Uh, or uh, let's turn this around. If I tell you the truth, it will be your ruin and therefore it will also be my ruin. So he sort of implies that the answer is bad for Oedipus. Uh, so of course, once Oedipus understands that Tiresias is deliberately not telling him what he knows, he gets angry. Oedipus, we will learn, gets angry very easily. What's that? You know and will not speak? Do you mean to betray us and destroy the city? 
Tiresias says something much more clear. I will not hurt myself or you. Why are you asking these futile questions? I won't answer. Uh, and so Idivis really gets angry. You evil monster, you'd enrage a rock. Um, and Tiresias says, even if I keep silent, it will happen. So he's saying like whether he says it or not, fate will still be fate. Nobody can change it. So he might as well not be the person to bring bad news. Let the king discover the truth by himself. Um, so Oedipus gets so angry that he starts. Uh, well, let's take a look. I am so seized by anger. I will not shield you or protect you from what I think. Know this. I reckon. You helped to plant the crime. Uh, I guess. And even did it, killing him, though not with your hands. If you could see, I'd say the deed was yours alone. So Oedipus thinks the only reason Tiresias would refuse to help save the city is because Tiresias himself is the guilty one. Uh, and this makes Tiresias angry. Uh, and he says, really? I tell you this, you must abide by that announcement you yourself just made. To abide by means to follow. So you must follow what the curse that you yourself just made. From this day on, you must not speak to us. You are the cursed pollution of this country. Um, so from this day on, which means from this day onward, which means from now on, uh, because it is himself is the pollution, he can no longer interact with anybody in the city. Now, of course, Oedipus doesn't believe him, right? How how dare you rustle up this accusation? Rustle up means like to to ping to to gather together um, with difficulty. So kind of like make up. How dare you make up this accusation? I mean, think about it. If you are the king and you are in pain for the suffering of your people, and this old blind guy says that you yourself is the cause of all of this. Would you believe him just like that? And so I think Oedipus, his reaction is. Well, I mean, when he gets angry first, that reaction is like when he thinks that Tiresias is part of a conspiracy, and that's not very reasonable. But here when he uh, when Tiresias accuses him and he gets angry, I think that's pretty reasonable. But the question is not about Oedipus. The question is about Tiresias. Do you agree that he was right? To refuse to answer the truth? And do you think that it was right for him to reveal the truth after he got angry? So the first one, he knows what he wouldn't say and he gives us his reason. He doesn't want to piss off Oedipus because it would be bad for himself. I guess that makes sense. He says that uh, it's fate, so no matter who tells Oedipus or not, it's going to happen. He, whether Tiresias talks or not makes no difference. So I guess it does make sense for him to try to protect himself. Well, what about changing his mind? 
if he does this only out of anger, probably not a wise thing to do. But remember, he also does this precisely because the danger to himself that he was trying to avoid has happened. The king has accused him. He is now in danger. Remember, right? He, Oedipus is the only king. He is the one guy with power. So if he thinks you were trying to betray him, you are in grave danger. So I guess it does kind of make sense for Tiresias now to tell the truth. He's already in danger. Uh, he might as well let Oedipus know what's really going on. Uh, but it, and like the anger part is secondary, right? It feels good to tell the truth. It feels good to hit back when someone is accusing you. But I don't think that should be the main reason. If it is his main reason, it's not a good one. OK, do you have questions or ideas about this question? OK, question five. What is the purpose of the second choral song? How can you tell? Page 19, page 20. Um, so his conversation with Tiresias has now finished. Um, Tiresias has explained the entire prophecy to Oedipus. Um, they both leave the stage. According to the translator. Uh, it's also possible that only Tiresias leaves because he doesn't have a second scene. This is his only scene. Um, and it's possible for Oedipus to stay on stage. It's also possible for Oedipus to leave first. And for Tiresias to stay and listen to the song or to leave after Oedipus. Uh, depends on what you think the relationship is between these two people and the elders of Thebes. Let's look at the song. Who did the things unspeakable, unspeakable with bloody hands of murder? So the first thing the chorus sings is that they Ah, I think somebody turned off my microphone. Uh, what was the last thing that you heard? Question five. Okay, so yes, so uh, question five, the purpose of the second choral song. Um, so at this point, the stage directions say that um, Tiresias and Oedipus exit the stage. But remember, this is added by the translator. Uh, so it's possible that Tiresias uh, leaves first and Oedipus stays to listen to the chorus. It's also possible that Oedipus leaves first and Tiresias stays. Um, but no matter whether it's before the chorus or after the chorus, Tiresias does have to leave because this is his only scene. He has nothing more to do in this play. Um, but whether you think they should leave early or late depends on what you think the relationship is between these two characters and the elders of Thebes, the chorus. 
so let's look at the song. Um, the chorus from the first two lines tells us they, the people of Thebes, aren't sure who to believe. It, should they believe Tiresias, who has the power of prophecy? Or should they believe their strong and trustworthy king who says he did not kill Laius and in fact blames Tiresias for a conspiracy? Uh, so who did the oracle mean? Who was the oracle talking about? Whoever it is, now it is time for him to move his feet in flight, which means to flee Taozhou. Uh, the son of Zeus is after him. Son of Zeus, this epithet is usually, this name is used for a powerful person. So here it's talking about Oedipus. And with him come the fates who never miss. Um, the word has now shown forth from snowy Mount Parnassus, uh, which is ho a holy mountain, that everyone must track the unseen man, the bull. To track means to trace. And uh, the chorus compares the murderer to a bull. Gongniu. He wanders through the wild wood. Wood means forest. The caves and through the rocks. Bereft, which means he has lost important things in his life. Unhappy on unhappy feet. Fleeing the oracles from the Earth's navel. Navel is uh, because it is the the Oracle at Delphi was breathing gas from below the Earth. That place was known as the Earth's navel. Uh, so here the chorus is imagining the killer running away from fate and prophecy, but fate and prophecy live forever. Uh, the wise interpreter of birds, Tiresias, has caused me terrible, terrible anxiety with words incredible and undeniable. On the one hand, incredible means not credible. Credible means believable. On the other hand, he's a prophet, so it's undeniable. So you can't deny it, but you can't believe it either. So that's why the chorus is full of anxiety. I don't know what to say. I fly on hope, not seeing the present, not seeing the future. So I don't know what's going on. I don't know what will happen. I can only have blind hope. I didn't know, and I don't know now, any conflict that arose between the sons of Labdicus and Poly Polybus' son. So Labdicus is Laius's father. So the son of Labdicus is Laius. Polybus is Oedipus's father. We will later discover his adoptive father, Jiangfu, uh, Jifu. Uh, so Polybus's son is Oedipus. So here the chorus is saying, I didn't know that these two men had any conflict uh, to use as evidence. Uh, because the prophecy says that the killer of Laius, or Tiresias says that Oedipus killed Laius. So the chorus is saying basically, why? I didn't know that he had a reason to want to kill Laius. Uh, and yet Zeus and Apollo are wise. They know and can see the mortal world. Uh, there is no true judgment to tell if a prophet is worth more than I am. So there's no way to tell whether a prophet really does know the truth. You can only believe in the gods. A man may surpass wisdom by wisdom. Uh, which on the surface means one person might be wiser than the other person. Uh, the footnote says this is also 
a very strange line. Uh, it basically means one person can know more than another person. But which is the person who knows more, Oedipus or Tiresias? When people are blaming, I never agree until I can see if their words are correct. Uh, after all, she with the wings in the past appeared to him, and by the test, he was seen as the wise one sweet to the city. This is talking about how Oedipus became king of Thebes. Right, he's not a citizen. He wasn't born here. People don't. He himself doesn't know that he has family here. How did he become king? The story is that uh, he was the person who defeated the Sphinx. Yuan Mian Sou Sen. So, Yuan Mian Sou. Uh, the Sphinx was a monster who appeared outside of Thebes and everyone who tried to pass by her, she blocked and said, you have to answer my riddle, Mi Yu. If you answer my riddle incorrectly, you get it wrong, I will kill you. But if you answer correctly and get it right, I will kill myself. So many people tried to answer the riddle and they all failed. The riddle, by the way, we don't get in this play, but in the mythic tradition, the riddle is this. What animal walks on four legs in the morning, two legs in the afternoon, and three legs in the evening? Oedipus was the only man to come up with the right answer. The answer is man. When humans are young, they crawl on the floor with four, uh, both feet and both hands. When they are adults, they walk on two feet. And in the sunset of life, when they are old, uh, they use a cane, guaizang, so it's three feet. Uh, and so uh, by killing or getting the Sphinx to kill herself uh, and allowing the people of Thebes to leave the city and also allowing the people of Thebes to access resources from outside the city again, such as food, a uh, very important resource, uh, Oedipus basically saved the city. And so the Thebans crowned him king. So here uh, the chorus is remembering that Oedipus was wise enough to save the city in the past. So when Tiresias says uh, Oedipus is the guilty one, there's reason not to believe Tiresias immediately. So by the end of this song, the chorus once again sides with Oedipus. Because of this, my heart will never discover him guilty of wrong. So without clear evidence, I will never believe that Oedipus is the guilty one. Uh, so what is the purpose of this second song? We as the audience have just witnessed Tiresias and Oedipus each accusing the other. Uh, but who should we believe? It is the chorus who gives us this background information. How trustworthy is each person? On the one hand, Tiresias uh, has knowledge from the gods. On the other hand, Oedipus was the wisest man to ever come to Thebes and save the city, and he truly loves the city and its people. So who to believe? That's the, I think, the purpose of this choral song, to emphasize how anxious and how troubled this argument makes the people. When two major uh, figures of the city disagree and argue with each other, 
Who should the people trust? Who should the people follow? I think that is the purpose of this second choral song to emphasize the conflict at the center of this play so far. OK, do you have questions about this one? OK, we have a little time left, so let's go back to the beginning and we'll look at the play in more detail. Uh, so these stage directions are the best guess of the translator. The translator believes that the chorus was in the orchestra, the circle part of the stage, which was usual. That's pretty uh, a pretty good guess. Then on the stage, in front of the skinny, a priest is gathered with acolytes, student priests, and a group of young children beside the altar. Uh, so uh, if you remember from the picture of the stage, on the two sides of the stage, there are raised platforms, your baotai. In this story, those are the altars, di si tai. Right, because he's a priest. A priest does his work at an altar. Uh, and apparently they are all like crying and praying and it's very noisy. And Oedipus comes out of the palace through the central doors behind the stage. Uh, so the middle doors of the skenny. And he talks to the crowd. His first word in the play, children. This tells us that he is king, right? Uh, first of all, he's talking to the group of children there, but he's also talking to uh, the priest and all of the other people in the city who are suffering and praying. To the king, they are all his children. Young ones nursed by this old city of Cadmus. Cadmus is the founder of Thebes, so Thebes is the city of Cadmus. Uh, to be nursed, Yang Yu. Why are you all sitting here in reeds and with those supplication branches? Uh, so we mentioned this in the Iliad. In ancient Greece, if you are a supplicant, which means you beg for something, there is a traditional pose, a tra traditional way that your body should be arranged. Uh, and traditional items that you should hold. So that is what these people are doing. They are sitting and kneeling in supplication to the gods and to Oedipus, the king, uh, with wreaths, uh, hua chen. Although in ancient Greece, it may not be flowers. It could just be branches or leaves. So I guess ye chen and branches for supplication. The city is all full of incense, xiang zhu, uh, for it used to pray to the gods, full of groaning, tongku de sen and of songs and prayers for healing. I thought it wrong to hear this second hand. Children, I came myself. So this tells us what kind of a king he is. When the people are suffering so much, he thought that he had to come and and hear it and understand it for himself. He shouldn't just depend on reports uh, from uh, his attendants and subordinates. Shashu. I am the man well known to everyone named Oedipus. This line does two things. First, it confirms to the audience that this actor is playing the character of Oedipus. Because remember, even though the play is called Oedipus, and even though uh, everyone already knew the basic story, 
they didn't know how this particular version of the story would go. So this is how the play introduces us to the main character. The second thing this line does is it shows Oedipus's confidence. He doesn't say I am Oedipus. He doesn't say I am Oedipus your king. He says I am the famous Oedipus, well known to everyone. So this is something, this is a part of his uh, identity that he cares about. That he has done something great enough that everyone in Thebes knows who he is. Uh, so this also tells us he believes that he is worthy of this fame, that it is deserved. Priest, as an elder, you should be the one to speak for all. What is your state of mind? Are you afraid of something? Wanting something? Uh, state of mind is basically what do you feel? What are you thinking? Indeed, I'd like to help with everything. Again, he cares a lot about his people. I would be cruel if I did not pity the desperate way that you are sitting here. The priest, Lord of my country, Oedipus, you see us gathered here at your altars, some so young and weak they cannot fly yet. So here he is comparing children to young birds, birds who are so young they have not yet learned to fly. Others heavy with age. So this tells us that the chorus is not just representing children, it's also representing old people. And this is also interesting because this is a plague, right? So uh, when people start falling sick and dying, we expect it, the middle aged men to die first because these are the people who go around the city doing important things, interacting with people. So they are more likely to get sick. So after they have died, the only people, the only men who are left are children and old men. I am a priest of Zeus. These children are special acolytes. And the footnote says that they are special because. Uh, in other words, they are not just any acolytes. They have been specifically chosen to come to beg for the king's help. That's why they're special. The other people crowd in the marketplaces wearing wreaths beside Athena's double shrine. So there are other people also begging for help from the goddess Athena. And by the Ismenus, the Oracle of Ash. Uh, and the footnote tells us uh, that the Ismenus is a river and that the Oracle of Ash likely refers to the Temple of Apollo. So the people are praying and begging to Oedipus, to Athena, and to Apollo. That's how desperate they are. See for yourself, the city reels. Reels here means so chuang, zong chuang. Uh, today in English, uh, we only use this word with this meaning. In one phrase. The mind reels at something, which means that when we think about something bad, the mind is shocked. Uh, but here it says the city is has been traumatized and shocked by this plague. Its head is sunk beneath the deep and bloody waves. So it's comparing the city to a ship and the ship is sinking. 
this was a common comparison in ancient Greece to compare a city or a government to a ship, the ship of state. And the king was considered to be the captain of the ship responsible for steering the ship of state in the right direction. But here the entire city is the ship of the entire city is sinking. So before next week, please read up to line 1110. So we're we're taking the play uh, around one third at, at a time. There's a total of um, how many lines is this? There's a total of 1530 lines, so we're reading about 500 lines each week. Um, and you can take a look at these questions. I, I think that next week's questions are very interesting. OK, do you have questions about this week? OK, see you next week.